All right, so the plan, folks, is that I'll be asking questions. There's a two-minute opening statement from each of you. Uh, we're not highfalutin, so we flip the coin ahead of your uh, being here, but with other people around, and if you trusted Ann, we'll go first in that and then Clem. And then with the nine, ten-minute segments, the idea is for you two to talk to each other uh, and, and for me to ask as, as few <coughs> questions as possible. It really would be nice to have some engagement there. Um, there there's not an audience to speak to, so if you could okay. speak to each other and ask each other questions, uh, I think that would be helpful. I'll apologize in advance because I probably will interrupt you with some questions, um, but that's, that's how we'd like to proceed. If there's not any questions, uh, I guess I'd invite you to start. Yeah, just a question. When you want us to ask questions, is that based upon what your original question is? Or sure. We'll how, have, how's uh, that going to work? I mean, so we'll have some large... Uh, Global questions? Some themes, I guess, to, for the 10-minute segments. So I might have a theme on uh, the weather. So if we had a theme on the weather, I'd ask you not to talk about financing unless that had to do with the weather. But I'll ask a particular or a specific question to start things off, and then you should feel free to <coughs> go ahead. And if you go too far afield, then I'm so inclined, I'll try to interrupt you. Okay. And as far as the opening, the two minutes, I'll put my hand up or something when it's about time to stop and just ask you to stop. Okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ann Johnston, candidate for mayor of Stockton. I'm a local business owner. I own the Ballonery on Harding Way. I've been in business 27 years. My husband and I have lived in this community 31 years. We've raised our family here. Our children have gone to our local schools. Uh, prior to that, I uh, grew up in Merced. I'm the oldest of seven children. I grew up on a farm. Went to San Francisco State University with a degree in social science, a secondary teaching credential. Spent two years uh, serving our country in the Peace Corps in Iran. Uh, came back, uh, taught for a number of years, and then my husband and I went into business. And so uh, we're really business people in this community. Uh, I served on the Lodi Unified School District Board of Trustees for 13 years during a time of rapid growth. Uh, major challenges in that area, both in terms of finance and in terms of facilities. It was the Prop 13 era. Uh, following that, I uh, was elected to the City Council for two terms during the time when we began the downtown revitalization and renewal under uh, Mayor uh, Dara and Mayor Podesto. Uh, very proud of the service and the accomplishments of that particular era and believe that we need to continue much of that effort and address the issues that we face today. Obviously, our major issue at the moment in Stockton is our economic situation, the budget that we face uh, is going to impact what we do in this city. We always have the problem of crime and crime prevention that is key in bringing in new businesses uh, and expanding businesses in our community. We have serious problems with our education system uh, that really need a partnership to develop solutions for them. Uh, basically, we need more jobs, we need more businesses, we need to work together to solve our myriad of problems. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Clem Lee. I'm a teacher. I'm a Stockton City Council member, and I'm a candidate for mayor. I offer my thanks to the record for hosting this event, as well as to my opponent for agreeing to participate. I would also like to thank Mrs. Johnston for her energy and visibility throughout this long campaign. I think it's safe to say that the citizens of Stockton have benefited and the eager prosecution of, of both of our campaigns. That said, I believe it has become clear that I am the best candidate to become Stockton's next mayor. It's not just about what either one of us says, it's about what each of us has said combined with what each of us has done. My opponent's track record simply does not match up with her rhetoric. Mine does. In my 14 years on the SUSD school board and in my four years on the city council, I have been straightforward, sometimes to a fault, but it has never been my way to attempt to tailor my words to what any one entity wants to hear, but rather to say the truth and act on it to the best of my ability to do so. My actions have sometimes put me at odds with powerful interests, unions, commercial retailers, special interests, developers, you name it. 
But most have come to respect the fact that while they may not agree with me on every issue, they know that I'll tell them where I stand and, what I, and that I will stick to my guns. The next mayoral term will be the most challenging, perhaps, in the history of Stockton. And Stockton deserves someone who has proven he can make the tough decisions and withstand the criticism that will go with this job every single day in the next term. I've said that it seems like I've been training for this job for most of my life. I believe I'm ready to serve, and I appreciate your consideration. The, the first subject to address them is crime, and the question goes to Clem. Chief Morris announced yesterday he retired. That's the third chief in relatively rapid succession. Is there a problem in keeping a chief in the police department? Whose fault is it? And what impact does it have? Well, yeah, it, it's a problem. Um, I think that, that we, I think that along the way, that probably some of the decisions to who the chief would be have exacerbated that problem and created an extra, you know, person in the revolving door. I think probably we, we should have had two chiefs instead of three in the period that we're talking about. Uh, I do think that it's a problem. Who's, who's at fault? I think we're collectively at fault for not having gone outside and looked nationally for a police chief. I think that um, it, it has just been too convenient, too comfortable to, to promote the next person in line. And while I have called for a nationwide search, I have been roundly dismissed in that, in that vein. And I, I think that it's what we must do now, and we must also structure either an employment agreement or a new method of, of getting the chief that that builds in some commitment to serve a term of time. And what do you think? Well, I, I agree that we should have gone national for a search for a police chief the last time around because after you've gone through two chiefs in about four years, uh, the handwriting's <coughs> on the wall that the statewide uh, or the local ordinance or the local policy that was in fact okayed by the state years ago that allows 3% at 50 when you retire at 50 it kind of sets it up for anyone who's in city service of police to retire at age 50. They have nothing to lose when they retire at age 50. They've got great retirement, they've got medical benefits for their life. So that's part of the problem is our chiefs with the experience that, that we need reach that magical age of 50 and they say, why should I hang around for this? This is too much hassle and they leave. So part of it is the state situation that allows cities to do this and to be, to be competitive, state, uh, cities I should say, cities have to offer that 3% at 50 benefit to, to attract police officers. So that I would dare to say probably is a condition in virtually every city, certainly every large city in, in California. So there's that issue. Our local issue is that we have not gone out and tried to recruit the best and the brightest from the nation. I frankly would like to get Chief Bratton from L.A. to come here and clean up Stockton like he did New York and like he's doing Los Angeles. I mean, all you have to do is read about what he did in New York City years ago in terms of turning around the crime statistics and the police department to know there are folks out there, there are police people out there who know how to get the job done and they come with a background of experience. And so. I think we need to be get going out there, and we also need, just as Clem said, we need to have an employment contract. They're going to be here for five years, I mean at the minimum five years. I would have hoped that the current city manager would have required that, that the, somehow the city's policies would have required that when our current chief and the chief before that were appointed that, you know, yeah, you don't have to, but you know, this is, this is an ethical thing. Please be here for five years minimum. So, well, I mean, that's right. And along those lines, I would, I would I need to say that given the fact that that the decision was made that we were going to promote Chief Morris, I took the extraordinary measure of sitting down with him prior to his appointment and having that eyeball to eyeball conversation um, because I was concerned primarily with how long he would stay and secondarily with, with what his style was going to be for managing the department. And, and you know, eyeball to eyeball, I got the commitment that I needed that I could that I could live with the with the appointment, and so it, it adds to my my really bitter disappointment in his in his decision because I I don't really feel that he kept his word. I'll respect his personal reasons for doing it, um, but I did have a question on the three percent at fifty. Now that 
you're saying that that's the result of a state law? Is that what I'm? But that state law did not mandate three percent no. at fifty, and the, and the council you were on did approve three percent right. at fifty. Okay, because that's correct. Sounded the, like the you council were, I was on approved it because every other city was approving it within the state of California any, of any size at all in order to retain police and to, and to uh, recruit police officers. And then, so later on, you will allow me to say that since every city is having fiscal problems, that then that's okay, because actually... Oh, no, it's not okay, though. The state law should be changed, I okay. believe. Well, I believe that's important. You're also on record as saying that you think the other units should have enhanced retirement benefits. Is that still the case? Uh, I don't know which which other units you would be talking well, about. Well, it would be pretty much the ones who've endorsed you, the, the, the smaller units. You've, you've said that they deserve higher retirement percentages than they currently have. Yeah, because they are way at the bottom of the barrel. They come nowhere near where the police and fire are in terms of retirement benefits. Well, I understand that. Yeah. I was so just wondering how you plan it, to... It's a fairness. It's an equity issue. It's, it's not leaving the, the bottom layers of, of employees down there at the bottom to not have any benefit or little benefit compared to those that are perceived to be more, quote, more important. Everyone is important in the city as an employer. Well, I would suggest that if everything is most important, nothing is most important. And I think that that you set the bar at 3%. You've, you've promised the, the, the smaller unions 3%, or you've promised them an enhanced retirement. I don't know that you said 3%. I did not say 3%. And you've also said that you, you plan to take that out of the hides of the other two unions. I mean, that was your, your answer was that you would negotiate away from them to pay I mean, I don't know how you're going to pay for I did not it. say that. I never indicated that we would take it from other other unions. You said you would that. renegotiate with police. We, everything should be renegotiated, Clem. The whole, all of the contracts that are out there should be renegotiated. They should be opened and looked at across the board for, for fairness and equity and to find the savings that we need. Oh, well, I would agree. I, so, I would agree you know, don't put words in my mouth saying I promised anyone 3% of this or that. My point is that that 3% provides a situation that makes it more difficult in tough financial times. And it makes it more difficult than to be fair to the other employees. Right. And, it, and for, for the record, those unions approached me about enhanced retirement, and I simply said, no, we can't afford it. I'm not willing to discuss it. Um, there's a lot of, of um, analysis that would, would indicate that, that they already have an enhanced retirement of, of sorts because of the the cap that our employees, um, their, their retirement is, percentage is able to grow more than other cities anyway. So they don't really have it as bad as they want. I think it's a critical issue. These unfunded mandates are, are killing us. And, I, and I'm not, you know, personally, you voted for the 3% at 50, and so, you know, that's on you. You can't blame it on a state law. You can't. In the same way that you blame, you know, uh, growth on an initiative um, in the late 80s. The initiative didn't mandate growth in those areas. It permitted it. It was still incumbent upon you to make the decision and to vote. Are we talking about voted. growth? I'm just saying. Are that we you, talking about the police department? Are we talking about that situation, the original question? We're talking about your blaming some other entity or some other authority on your decision, sloughing off the fact the three percent at fifty has been a huge financial burden on the on the on the city, and you voted for it. But it, it's never about you; it's about the state law making you do it, and that's that's my point. Well, I'm curious: would you try to undo three percent at fifty? No, because you can't undo three percent at fifty. You can't undo. You have to truly understand collective bargaining, and that is, you know, that's war. So once, and this is my point: I wouldn't have given it. Because I learned, being on a school board, what one measly percent in total compensation does to your budget. When I joined the school board, we, we just had settled a strike, and the board then had given this, this raise that was 2 or 3% more in two consecutive years than it should have been. It was debilitating. We laid people off for three years because of that. So, what you, what you have for me is I'm going to hold the line, and I've told the other unions that we're going to hold the line. And I don't dismiss the fairness argument, because I think that that's important, but I think that their retirement is more enhanced than they're presenting. Their numbers don't, don't jive, and that's, that's all I'm saying. We'll, so, we'll come back to uh, labor negotiations. That's, that's fine. Yeah. We're going on to another subject now, and the question okay. starts off for you. So this is about development.
and opposed to downtown development, which we'll come to later. This is about okay. development of the purchase. Uh, and at a Comcast forum, and you said that development north of Hammer Lane but south of Eight Mile Road, you'd been told by developers that they would include such amenities as shopping complexes, offices, retail. And you said you learned a lesson uh, about developers after that when they just built houses. Uh, I'm wondering if that's a lesson you should have known when you were on the council, uh, what the repercussions are, and how do you fix it going forward? Well, obviously, uh, I should have known a lot more than I, we all should have known a lot more. There have been many decisions made that we didn't have full disclosure of all the ramifications and all the pros and cons. Uh, when I was on the Stockton City Council, remember, I was on the council from January 1996 to December 2002. And following my departure from the council is when the most rapid growth in real estate occurred here in Stockton. It was just beginning when I left the council. During the latter part of the 90s, there were development projects that came forward that had been approved by a voter, by an initiative in the mid-1980s. And so they were basically on the books, too. They were not entitled yet, but many of there were, I'll, I'll use one example. What is now Spanos West, which is now the shopping center out there, that whole area uh, to the west of I-5, south of 8 Mile, that whole big chunk of land was sold, quote, sold to the city council as a high-tech business park. We did a special zoning on that, an MX zoning. The city had not had an MX zoning before, which is mixed use. It is the same zoning that's at University Park down here on Harding Way where there's, a mix, there's going to be a mixed use of education, retail, office space. Spanos came before us and asked for an MX zoning to bring in a high-tech business park. There would be some homes there that would be obviously for the people who worked in this high-tech business park. The sale was, quote, Silicon Valley, it's time we have high-tech, we're going to do all the, uh, the uh, lines, the wiring, all this stuff to make it possible. Well, obviously, that did not come to pass. And again, the market is, is to blame for all of that, according to the developer. We approved that with the idea that that's what it was going to be, that's how the design was laid out. And it did not come to pass. It got rezoned, it got changed back to straight residential, much like Western Ranch did. And West, there are many people in Western Ranch still who are very unhappy about what happened to Western Ranch because what was promised there did not, did not you know, come to fruition. Now, the lesson I learned, other than not believing everything you're told, is you do development agreements that have that are actually specific plans that have the, the framework for making sure that there are no zoning changes as this development moves forward. You have agreements that, there, that you have the affordable housing, the mixed uses, you have these things in place and so whoever buys the land has to abide by those specific agreements in the development plan. Do you think the Mariposa Lakes uh, specific plan that is going through is an appropriate one then? I think it is because it basically uh, memorializes the elements of a plan that should be in any kind of development in the city of Stockton. Now, it, it sounds beautiful. It's got all the elements that are required. They've agreed to virtually everything from putting in land, building schools, to lead certification, all of those things. The key part is making sure that when they sell off the land, the developers who come in and build those projects will adhere to that. And the plans as they are written, I believe, actually will require that. Because anybody could put a development plan out there for approval. It's what happens when it moves down the pipeline and those pieces are sold off and how far those developers or builders live with the development plan as it's written. So it, the devil is in the details and Stockton has to make sure that we have development agreements that are basically specific plans that lay it out, enumerate it, exactly what's going to happen and memorialize it in the deed work and all of the uh, legal documents that go with the development. Which we will now do because that is what the, the new general plan requires. And we will do that. And listen to what you just heard. You basically heard, you know, and I'm, I'm only, I'm, I'm going to be critical here because it, it's important to draw the distinction. But I don't blame you for the votes you took on development. Because 
you you joined a council and that's what was going on and you know you 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 took it at face value but the problem is you voted over a hundred times for projects you're still blaming that 1980s initiative that initiative did not approve it permitted there is a huge difference a huge difference and Ms. Johnson I've examined the record you were not beaten the you know you're not on your soapbox during these council meetings some citizens were saying you're you're getting out here LeBaron Estates you know you're you're encroaching on farmland you're getting pretty far north you're getting out here you were silent except for your affirmative vote and you're right there were two or three that you didn't vote on but by and large you approved this stuff I I don't hold you so much I don't blame you so much for that except that the way that you're trying to repackage yourself and what you're basically saying is that that you're excused from you know the 11,000 plus units that you approved and that somehow we're now on the wrong track the fact is if the development that happens through 2035 well not if if development happens through 2035 it's going to be exponentially better than any of the development that happened under the 1990 general plan we have some of those developments which are already blighted and crime ridden. The city will check its box first under the current general plan. The city will be made whole. New development will pay for itself. A planning commissioner asked when Mariposa Lakes was in front of the planning commissioner, will this project pay for itself? The answer was yes. The city gets to check its box first. We will have police and fire and bricks and mortar paid for first. The developers can then figure out how to make their money, and they will because that's what they do. That isn't my issue. But if it, I've already had a developer tell me, well, I may not be able to do this project. And I said, well, so what? He said, don't do it. And why? He said, I can't make any money. Well, when you figure out how to make money, I imagine it'll come forward. So the bottom line is this, that we are headed in the right direction with, with development. The development that my opponent has participated in is a huge part of the problem that we have now. And the worst part of it is this. It led us to Eight Mile Road, and it is so disingenuous to have taken us to Eight Mile Road and now draw the line at Eight Mile Road because the developments out there want to happen because of what's happened for the last 15 years. What about that? The greatest growth has occurred in the last six years. All of these projects that were out there have happened in the last six years during the housing boom. I mean, that's what's happened. Our homes have become affordable for Bay Area dwellers. They moved in. We all know what's happened to the economy with the, with the finance structure, the credit lines. People came in, bought the homes, the market was there. So all the development, the significant part of it has occurred over the last six years. Yes, I approved developments when I was on the city council. Yes, I denied developments. It was not, there was not a land rush when I was on the city council. There was housing development that was fairly moderate, fairly regulated. I remember sitting in developers' offices and they're whining about the fact they hadn't sold more than three homes that month. And these were new developments that were just going in near Bear Creek, near the high school. So I think that, again, I think we all can share the blame for where we are today. Have we learned from the past? Absolutely. And I think that it's important that we, we recognize the collective, uh, the collective lessons that we've learned and that's why when I left the city council and saw that the general plan was going to be revised, having learned what I did when I was on the council in terms of, of developer uh, you know, uh, uh, promises, I felt it was critical that we devise a general plan that spoke to smarter growth practices than we had been practicing. So do, you defend, the, so do you defend your votes on, on the 11,000 units as correct? Do you defend your development votes? Absolutely. At the time, they were perfectly fine. At the time, there was the services were there. No, no, the, but they were entitlements. They didn't build houses the next day after you approved them. The houses that were built that you're talking about are the ones that you approved when you were on the council. No. Cleb, listen. It, we, I approved developments that were in line, that were logical at the time. They were not out there where they shouldn't have been. The, the services were provided. And it was not, a t the, everything was there in place that needed to be in place. Well, that's not It true. was not, that's, no. That's not true. I mean. That's a nice story, but it's not true. Well, your story is, is just as fallacious. So, you know, give, give us a break here. I mean, my point is, 
we have a situation and we have to go forward doing better in this community. I agree. And, and we, I think... <laughs> and we started doing that. We started doing that. Yeah, when? When we adopted the general plan that require, that basically safe, safeguards us against 15 years of, of sprawl that you presided over as a member of that council. No, it doesn't. That's it what is we a did. blueprint. It's you, the general plan that your council approved, which I fought against most of the provisions of that in the ter time that I've been off the city council. The provisions that you actually put into place, it doubled the size of this community in 20 years. They, it is a recipe for sprawl, and I don't care if you think the policies are in that general plan that would prevent that. They're not in that plan to any significance that would require all of those, all of those developments that spread out north of Eight Mile Road, east and west, and every which way to do what needs to be done to have good, controlled, smart growth. That's where we're going to end on, on this one. Okay. Let's move on to talk about the city manager and the administration. Now, the question's for you, Clem. Uh, you said before the primary election, we keep everything on the plate too long. We don't check enough boxes. Uh, what's been kept on the plate too long at City Hall? Uh, and why haven't, hasn't the city, under your council, checked enough boxes? I think that there, there has been a tendency on the part of Gordon Palmer to be extraordinary, extraordinarily methodical in the wake of the, of the person that he replaced. And I believe that, that decisions have, have become ponderous and, and, and very slow. I'm talking mostly about administrative decisions. Like what? The reorganization took, took him an extraordinarily long time. I mean, given the fact that we had a consultant's, you know, two cents, a very credible consultant's two cents on on what a reorganization might entail, it it just took too long. He he just needs to pull the trigger more quickly. He needs to come out of the box right now and tell this community what he's going to do about the chief of police. That needs to happen immediately, not in a week, not in two weeks, not in a month, not when Morris actually leaves the building. That's what there there is. There's considered to be a, a, a vacuum. In, in leadership, and that, that is part of it. It's the methodology. It's not necessarily his intentions, not necessarily his analysis, but you have to act. Leadership is, a, is an active thing, not a passive thing, and you have to act. And as a result, I, I do think that some matters just stay on the plate and get, get bigger than they need to be. Well, that's my biggest criticism with the last four years in City Hall, is there has been no leadership, there's been no direction, um, you know, you can talk about standing up and doing things, but I haven't seen very much done. Everything's been given to the city manager who is overseeing a city hall that a consultant last year called constipated because nothing gets out. Everything goes in and nothing gets out. So I think it's, it's important that, you know, leadership needs to be taken by the mayor and the city council. And if Gordon Palmer, any other city manager, is not, not producing the information, not taking the actions, not acting uh, proactively, then they have to hold them accountable. It, it really, the buck stops with the elected officials. And the most frustrating thing I have always had with city operations is how long it takes to get anything out of a city hall, how long it takes to get responses to, uh, to requests for information, to, particularly to financial reports. I mean, in reality, you know, this whole budget situation would not have occurred had there been somebody paying attention to the newspapers a year and a half ago, paying attention to the stock market, paying attention to what's happening out in the community with businesses. We wouldn't be having to, to reduce 23 million right now. We would have started a year ago in the budget that was begun last November. So I'm saying that there's no leadership. There's a lack of direction, the city manager is not held accountable, city staff is, you know, swirling around trying to figure out what ends and what end is up, and, and that's the problem. Would, would you lead an effort to replace Gordon? I, I won't say I will, would lead an effort. I believe in giving people a fair chance. I want him to perform. I want to see how he performs under a new direction, a new mayor, a new city council. Because I've heard a lot of people, a lot of uh, criticisms, a lot of positive things from both sides, and I believe in giving people a fair chance. And I don't, I've never worked with the man, I do not know. 
I believe that he needs a fair shot at it. If he can't perform, then we need to look for another city manager. It's real simple. This is, and I would agree with that. Gordon Palmer is a good man of the utmost integrity, and he deserves a fair chance from whichever one of us uh, is elected. He also deserves some direction. And I would agree that he hasn't, hasn't received that as fully as he might have. But let's talk about leadership then. If, you know, and I've hammered this before, we talked, we chatted in the lobby about, we, we've all heard this before, we could probably recite each other's lines and, you know, just in fun trade seats and, and have a second debate where we were each other and probably do just as well. But the fact of the matter is, where's, where's the leadership when I inherit a budget that has no formal reserves? And I know that you'll eventually get around to trying to call a fund balance formal reserves, but they're not formal reserves. If we had the kind of reserves that we're supposed to have, if we had them from the time you started on the council in 1996, we would be able to mitigate this financial crisis the way reserves are supposed to allow you to mitigate a financial crisis, and we wouldn't have the dire situation that we have. And again, as long as we're forecasting, let's just be clear that six months ago you told these, these small unions that you would enhance their retirements, but you also foresaw this, this big economic crisis. Well, the fact is that those two things are kind of mutually exclusive. You're not going to enhance somebody's retirement benefits package if you've got this kind of crisis looming on the horizon. Um, I have led and I have moved the agenda. When I'm given an opportunity, and I've been given many opportunities because Mayor Chavez has relied upon me to take on tough assignments, we would not have a big box ordinance for the city of Stockton if not for me. Let me just say that. It's the truth. I'm not breaking my arm, patting myself on the back. I made that happen. That was going nowhere. I said, get it on the agenda, let's do it. Things big and small, the therapeutic pool on Bianchi Road, the Easter Seals folks were gonna cut us loose and, and we were going down the river without a therapeutic pool that was used by hundreds of elderly folks, low-income people who, who didn't have the resources to go searching out the other therapeutic pool, which you know, God only knows where that is. I asked the mayor to put me on the ad hoc committee, he put me on it, and not only did we fix the problem, but I, I made staff move the agenda and get it on, on council agendas far sooner than they wanted to do it. Over and over I've played that role. We, we added cops to the budget because I insisted. Staff was trying to take them off. I added them. Now the trick is going to be, the leadership trick with this budget, is we, I don't care about the MOUs and the raises and all of that nonsense. We need to fill our quota of police officers. And if that needs to be part of this overall budget thing, if we're going to start treating police officers as equal to every other employee in the city, I think that's just folly because eventually we're going to hear how out of control crime is. If everything's most important, nothing's most important, you have to take care of whatever your top priority is first. And what about the big box ordinance, the therapeutic pools and the police officers? So those examples of leadership, uh, can you give us some examples of yours? Can I respond to what Please. he said about the reserves first and then let mm -hmm. me go with that? Oh, yeah. um, the re Stockton didn't have an official reserve budget, quote, reserve budget, but it had money in, in certain accounts and it had carryover funds. And yes, my uh, Clem doesn't think that that counts as a reserve. We, we were not in flush economic times in the 90s. We, we were at times where we barely balanced a budget and we balanced them on vacancies. That's a fact. You all know that. Uh, but we were able to get through some of the tougher times. And our employees also didn't take cost of living raises for several years, too. We were able to negotiate our way through the situation. So I think that's key to remember about the economic times that there were. And frankly, I never promised any unions any, I never promised them enhanced benefits. I don't make promises to unions because I'm not in a position to do that. It's all part of negotiations. I said we would fairly look at them. We would examine them for equity and fairness. I have not promised anyone any enhanced retirement benefits. As far as leadership in terms of the financial situation, Clem has been head of budget committee for the last four years. I've been off the council for six years, for crying out loud. Budgets were in his responsibility at that time. I mean, I was not on the council to watch for it, but certainly you would think that the head of the budget committee would be paying far more attention to the income, the revenues, and the expenditures when you're looking at budgets over the last four years. Obviously, this whole situation with the, the nation and the state has occurred over the last two years, 
But it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to see that it was happening two years ago and appropriate action should have been taken. So where was he in the whole budget process at that time? Because that to me is a major responsibility. Cities are driven by budgets. We have to be sure that the budget is balanced and sound and based upon realities, not wish lists. And to build this year's budget on a 5% increase in sales taxes, who would they talk to? All they had to do is go out to a local retail business and say, what, what are your sales like? I could have told them, they're down. Our sales tax are down. What's your property valued at? Well, it's down because of the economy. It's a no-brainer if you look at revenue and expenses. So I say that, you know, blaming it all on past councils for what's happening today is ridiculous. You know, this whole situation has occurred over the last four, five, six years. It's critical that, that we take it as it is today and really look at it objectively. As to the big box ordinance, I'll give him credit. He did, got the big box ordinance. I would have supported it as well. I think that that was a good ordinance. No big deal. As in terms of filling all the vacancies in the police department at this time and just hiring police, I think that's totally wrong because I believe we'll never have enough police officers on the street. We have to do crime prevention. We really have to work with gang enforcement. We have to work with schools to stop truancy. We have to be out there stopping crime before it starts, and we have to engage neighborhoods in doing that. So it, it's got to be a balance again. Just hiring more police officers will never cut it in my book. But, but well, let's, let's, let's move on to the budget. No, I'm going I'm I'm to say this. I'm going to say this. This is the difference. This is the difference, okay? Well, we're going to move on to talking about the budget, and you're happy to, happy to hear you okay. talk about it there. You got it. Go for it. In May, you voted for a budget that spent down not formal reserves, but fund balances. That Moody's then came back and said that that was not acceptable, and, and your finance officer and the finance committee agreed, and I think the council does now too. Why did you vote to approve that budget, given how it was structured at the time? Well, it was based on the information that, that was that was put in front of us, and we had, and we, we voted for that. And you know, in 2020 hindsight, and now you're going to see the difference. It was a mistake to vote for that budget. I shouldn't have I shouldn't have bought into the, some of the assumptions and some of the forecasts that were put in front of me. I made a mistake. Okay, you will never hear that here. It isn't going to happen. Okay, now. As far as the practical effect of that, it would have, it's just a matter of when we would have started dealing with this stuff. Okay, so we're talking about months. After we approved the budget, property value was devalued. Now that is not within our control. Now maybe it should have been somebody's business to know that was coming, I'm not sure. So the first thing is I can conduct a witch hunt or I can deal with what's in front of me. But a lot of the forecasts have not been upheld. And again, I won't get, you know, I'll get hammered for this too, but this is not unique to Stockton. A lot of people's forecasts have suffered given the, the economic realities. We have a perfect storm going on, and it, it you know, maybe starts with the, with the housing market. Wherever it starts, it has certainly, you know, snowballed into something that was much bigger than anybody would have forecast. But I will reiterate, here's the big difference. It's okay to balance a budget through the fairly untransparent methodology of, of maintaining vacancies and of, of, of uh, squirreling away money that is really unknown to the public in accounts. That's acceptable, apparently. Well, it isn't acceptable. Anything we've done is out there for everybody to see. The council that my opponent was on did routinely balance the budget with, with, by managing its vacancies. That's not ethical. If you budget for the positions, you should fill the positions. That's a commitment that you have to the, to the people in Stockton. And I'll tell you what, prevention is very important. But we know we're probably 100 cops short. I'm just talking about getting to 441 positions. We're probably still 100 cops short. And, that, it, and that's with good prevention which we need. There's no doubt about it. So let's be clear. What I'm hearing here is that my opponent doesn't want the police department at full strength given the budget constraints. And I'm saying we have to figure out how to balance the budget and keep our full complement of police officers on the streets because they have more than they can handle as it is. 
Yeah, and the police department is down to 441 right now. Are, are you for increasing that number back to 441? Not now, no, absolutely not. And I wanted to ask you about the budget too. Do you, do you think it was a mistake when you were on the council not to have a formal reserve policy? Or do you think it was a mistake to balance the budget by not funding positions? No, it, obviously it was, it was a mistake not to have a formal reserve fund. Um, it's important that any entity has a rainy day fund. When I was on the school board, we struggled to maintain a 3% reserve because at the time I was on the Lodi school board, we had major financial issues as well. We sometimes couldn't make that 3% reserve. The city of Stockton uh, obviously had no formal reserve, but we had a greater carryover. And yes, there were funds there that, that had money in them that should we run into deep trouble, could have been borrowed from or tapped from to help get through a tough time. And, and the idea of, of balancing the budget on vacancies, it was transparent. It, we all knew that they weren't filled, they weren't going to be filled, and there was always hope that if the economic situation improved, more revenues came in, some of those positions could be filled. They were held there. It's no different than what they're doing today. They're, hold, they're freezing positions. They're holding vacancies. That's how the budget is being proposed to be balanced this year, correct? But I mean, But we're formally doing it. We're not pretending to have them open, knowing that we're not going to fill them to provide that service. We're telling the public, we're not going to fill this position, and that's not what you did. When you when you hold you know, police officer positions open that you have budgeted, you're lying to the public. We have had police officer vacancies forever because we've never been able to recruit enough police officers to fill those vacancies, even when we had money. So I think I, I think it you know it's not an argument. Uh, when a, when budgets were passed, it shows how many openings there are. It shows how much they're budgeted for, and if, if the, the, uh, if the uh, positions don't materialize, if there's not money, they're not filled. I see nothing wrong with that, frankly. You don't see any correlation between a commitment to filling X number of police officers? I mean, these folks aren't, aren't sweeping up or, Clem, or trimming they can't, trees. They're, they're, the people aren't out there to fill them. They're, like I said, they've had openings <clears throat> forever that were funded in the budget and really would have been, the money would have been used in the budget if there were enough applicants. There well, have not been enough to get through the training. The, but it wasn't like it was a big surprise. This was a, meth a, a methodology for balancing the budget. We'll just agree to disagree. I find it dishonest to say we're going to hire this many, that we're going to budget for this many police officers, wink, wink, but we know we're only going to fill this many. It has a direct correlation to public safety. And actually, at the same time that I added the 16 officers back to the budget proposal two years ago, we also decided to streamline how we hire them, and we actually kicked it in high gear, and we were on track to hit the 441. I mean, we actually got within eight of that position before all of this stuff started to break down. So we, we were getting it right. We, there were four or five things that we were doing structurally, we're probably doing them forever, that made it very difficult to hire cops. So it wasn't so much a matter that there weren't enough of them out there, we were kind of getting in our own way. We stopped doing that, and we were on our way to filling it to 441. And I think that that's critical. There, all the other stuff you've said is to, prevention is paramount. But it is dishonest to budget for positions and then do the laissez-faire thing, not fill them, and say, oh well, but we balanced our budget. A budget is a, is a commitment to the citizens on how you intend, not want, not wish to spend your resources on how you're going to do it. And that's what it is, and it's dishonest if you, if you intentionally do that with that vacancy management thing, which is what the council always used to do, that's not right. We were told all along by the chief of police, who was Ed Chavez at the time, that they couldn't get enough recruits, they didn't have, you know, even though there were budgeted positions, that the difficulty was in recruitment and getting enough people to go. So if the council has in fact improved that and made it easier to recruit, and I know there were major issues with recruitment and, and standards and all of that stuff, that's a positive, that's good. It's a positive, and here's what, it, I had the same experience. Wayne Hose looked at me and said, we can't fill these, yeah. we can't fill the positions that's we right. have. The difference is, I said, baloney, do it. HR, what are we doing that doesn't work for hiring cops? Fix it. And they did. So that was me. I mean, I guess we have to pat ourselves on the back, but that was me. I don't accept every answer I get. 
probably accept too many of them as it is. Let's talk about downtown redevelopment. Yeah. Question goes to you, Ann. You made a lot in the primary campaign about Paragaries yes. uh, and the subsidy of that project, but you were on the council when it voted to pay some $9.6 million to help the Barquettes build city center cinemas. Mm -hmm. Why is that deal any different, and why was that an okay project to subsidize? That was okay because we needed a major project to bring people downtown. That was, that was the first retail, commercial, entertainment project that we had in the downtown. We had built Weber Point, we built the Charlie Square, we did the ESC building, we, re we started the renovation of the Hotel Socket, but we needed a single retail, commercial, entertainment project that would actually lure thousands of people to the downtown, and that was it. We determined it was a Cineplex. And the, the deal, I believe, was a good deal for the, for the uh, catalyst project that we, we wanted it to be that it was key that, that that take place because from that catalyst project the idea was to, ex to develop all the area around the Cineplex, the, the bottom of the Hotel Stockton, all the peripheral uh, blocks around there was again retail, commercial, entertainment, those kinds of things. So that was the key project. It never went much beyond that in terms of subsidizing other, other entertainment or uh, commercial businesses. And yes, we spent money in redevelopment because we needed to, but the goal always was to reach a point where then you, you, you question the subsidy and the amount of the subsidy because those catalyst projects that I just mentioned, including cleaning up the South Shore and the North Shore for private development, those catalyst projects were going to be the enticements to bring in the private sector dollars. Because private sector dollars is the only thing that is going to bring downtown back. It can't be any more public funds. It's got to be private sector, and we have to provide, you know, um, we have to get out there and recruit and bring those folks in. The Paragaries say, my, do you want me to expound on Paragaries just a bit? What I would, what I would have done well, that I've been on him. the council? Yeah. Yeah, I, what I would have done is, is I would have asked the questions, all right, is Paragaries the only restaurant that's interested in this site? Uh, has this particular site, the entirety of it, been offered to other businesses in Stockton? Uh, has there been any RFP put out for, for businesses within the city to come in and take over spaces within that? I believe it, the original intent was to develop the Hotel Stockton as a residential facility. The rooftop restaurant is a rooftop restaurant run by a private enterprise. The downstairs floor the, on, the, on the street level was going to be small uh, retail commercial businesses that would be in there serving the people who come to the Cineplex, who live in the Hotel Stockton, who work in downtown. Dry cleaners, coffee shops, you know, boutiques, whatever. That was the original goal. I'm not sure where it all came down to deciding a you know, white tablecloth restaurant was the thing to put there. But had the city wanted to invest 2.5 million or 2.7 or whatever it is at this point, it would seem to me if they're really going to subsidize, they should have subsidized the rent for 10 or 12 small local businesses to establish themselves in that street, in that bottom floor, give them, give them the rent free for a couple of years, which are the hardest for new business, and then see how that works. And then you would be supporting local business, not someone from out of town, who is bringing in a restaurant. Lord knows we have lots of restaurants in Stockton. But where is the support for local small business when you give this kind of a tax subsidy to someone from out of town? Well, I don't, I don't know that we have you know, all that many restaurants because what I constantly hear is that when there are events, particularly multiple events, that there is a, still a dearth of, of restaurants and, and, and that we need uh, paragaries. Getting back to the, the Cineplex to a certain degree is still under a subsidy of sorts, at least pending, um, the, the city's liability. So this is where, when we talk about moving forward with strictly, and now you've, you've been pretty precise here about this is all going to be about private dollars. Well, nobody believes that. Nobody believes that. I don't believe it because it's not true. And you can you go out and talk to folks. There will continue to be subsidy in the area, if, in the redevelopment area, if we're going to finish the job. Now, there should be increased private investment, as there was with the Sheridan Hotel, 
which I understand is you know going through its own its own problems, not operationally. It's upside down on its construction loan because of the condos. Uh, but so the fact is that if if the Cineplex tails off, the city is still holding the bag because there are there are are uh, thresholds that have to be met in terms of how many people come down. Now that's that's all fine and good, but they go on for quite a bit. They're still they're still in effect, and if if business falls off at the Cineplex, the city is liable to make them whole, and that's absolutely true. You know, you, there are some things you just can't explain to everybody's satisfaction. Paragary's is one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of a situation. And, you know, in 10 years, we'll probably know if it was the right thing to do or not. I feel like it was the right thing to do. We didn't need 10 little restaurants down there. We, it, it begged for a restaurant that was, that was a substantial restaurant and fairly upscale. I never liked the term white tablecloth. That came from the previous council. They actually initially uh, approved an MOU with Paragary's. But the fact of the matter is that you needed somebody with a little corporate footing. You needed somebody with an experience in redevelopment. And Paragary's fit that bill. That's the Podesto Council had confidence in that, so we moved forward with the deal. The fact is, what do we get out of it? We have a restaurant in downtown Stockton in a critical place. I think that it's important. We have retail expectations in the rest of the building that are not manifesting because of the economy. And in fact, Paragary's is suffering because of the economy. So the subsidy is the only thing that's keeping anything in there at all. And the fact is, that my opponent would be here hammering me if the place were empty right now, which it probably would be, and I would deserve to be hammered, if we had not approved the Paragary's deal. It's just too easy to pretend that we would have crowded that place with a bunch of small restaurants. From, my, from what I understand, and I, you know, the place was shopped around, I don't think they did an RFP, maybe that would have been the thing to do. That's not how we inherited. They talked to local restaurants, people did not express an interest. So, all I know is that sometimes you just move forward and you do what's right. We, we bollocked up the first MOU with, on the Paragary's deal because we didn't have it in writing how much we were going to spend on that building. That's a mistake that I admitted. I was attacked for admitting that mistake in the, in the primary, but we also fixed that mistake. So here you go, another contrast. When I make a mistake, I say I made a mistake. And I was a driving force between bringing that back with concrete numbers so that we didn't just have an, an open pit of money at the, at the hotel stock. We had serious problems we had to fix, but we needed to know how much we were going to spend. And that I will take full responsibility for. You can respond if you like, or else I could ask some other questions. Go to another topic, please. Well, I guess I would like to stay on here because I have okay. one question, and that is that in the primary literature there was a lot of talk about that money that could have been spent for, there was a comparison to a police helicopter mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and other police and tree right. functions that the right. city attorney has said uh, likely would be illegal to have spent redevelopment money for. Could you explain that? Oh, right. Redevelopment money is identified and earmarked for certain things, but what happens is that the general fund gets impacted even by that because you know you've got money from the general fund that that um, is loaned to the redevelopment agency and that there's been loans to redevelopment you know back and forth and so general fund monies when they're used in redevelopment even if they're a loan because they're expecting payback on it from redevelopment funds could still be used where there are truly enough money in redevelopment to do those things. So, you know, it's every pile of the city's budget uh, has some interaction with other other piles. And I guess the the really important thing here is the priorities of of the city of Stockton in terms of what's really important here. Is it more important to have a restaurant under the Hotel Stockton? or to buy a police helicopter or put more police officers on the street. And the perception, the, the thing is, the public doesn't understand about, you know, redevelopment dollars versus general fund dollars. So they just see the city's money. It's just like right now, the criticism of the marina project, because it's being built down there, and it's being built with grants and loans from the state. Why is the city continuing on with the marina project when we're in such a financial hole? Do you think it shouldn't be? 
Oh, I think it should be continued. I would support that. Would you comment on the redevelopment loans? She sent out a mailer saying she would rather have a police helicopter yeah. than pay 10 bucks for a burger. She implied that she would not have, if she didn't state, and, and forgive me, I don't memorize your mail, but the fact of the matter is that I don't know what she just said. And if people don't understand the difference between the general fund and redevelopment money now, they certainly don't after that answer. The bottom line is she can't have it both ways. You can't buy a police helicopter with redevelopment money. Bottom line, it was dishonest. That's all you got to say. Let's talk about labor. And I'm curious, you said earlier that we shouldn't be at full staff in the police department. We should be instead be spending some money, I think you said, on prevention and other programs in the city. Uh, if our full staffing is 441, what number are you comfortable with you know, police officers? I'm not saying we shouldn't to? be at full staffing. Obviously, that's the goal, but in tough financial times, you don't work to get full staffing in any particular department because everyone should be feeling the pain of budget cuts. So in the next year or two, if, if the economy picks up and the money comes in, absolutely, we should be working toward full staffing. But given the projections that are there now for the next year or two, Chief Morris said before he retired that he expected he could lose another 5 to 10 uh, in addition to the ones he's they already They should down. be filled. Those should be filled? Absolutely. The retirement should be filled. So, so there shouldn't be a hiring freeze at the police department right now? I don't believe there should be a hiring freeze necessarily there. I, th some of the, I think you need to look at every, every particular class of employees critically. The employees that are bringing in money, that are checking on business licenses, that are following the permit center, you know, bringing in fees, actually out there working in the community to, to re raise revenue, we should look at that very critically. The grant writers who are bringing in grant funding, if they are actually producing grant monies, they well certainly pay for themselves. I think we should look at each position critically. But I think we should not go lower in the police department than we are now if, if, if it can be avoided. And I don't necessarily know, again, I don't know that the freeze is the actual way. The freeze makes it, I would rather leave vac vacancies open rather than freezing everything. Oh, we're just talking about labor. I think you need a full police force. I've said that. I haven't heard anything differently except now she's answered on both sides of the question. So I'm not really sure where she is. I'm How telling you. That? Well, I'm just telling I don't know where you are. You don't want to do it. You want to do it. You're not sure if the freeze is the right thing. I'm saying, and I'm willing to say, and I have said publicly, that we should have a full complement of police officers, regardless of what impact that has on the total budget. You know, when I was on the school board, the employee groups that were not the teachers were always struggling for that profound respect that employee unions want to feel. As compared to the teachers, I'm sorry folks, the people who deliver the service in an educational system are teachers. Okay, In a city, one of our primary responsibilities is public safety. That is on the top of every citizen's list as they fear, as they do, that crime is closing in around them. So all I'm saying is whatever we, have, whatever we have allocated in terms of positions in the police department, I would like to not see them frozen. I would like to see them filled. All of the other issues notwithstanding, the raises, the benefits, the this and the that, I think we need to have a full complement of police officers. It's, it's a matter of our commitment to public safety as being number one. It does not, that does not taint my opinion about prevention. I, I believe that we must do much, much more, but not at the expense of, of those positions in the police department. See, and my position really is that the the current uh, full force is based upon a budget that's got you know quicksand under it. So how do you, in fact, fill all of the the the, uh, the budgeted vacant or the budgeted positions when you don't have the money to do that? So I believe that what the very least you can do is maintain what you have right now and keep them working. And that means that if people, many officers retire, we need to be able to backfill those. We don't need to decrease the police force. I'm simply saying, given the financial situation, we can't responsibly increase it significantly because of the amount of money it takes from the budget. So we have to be thinking about how we can do more with less or with what we have and, and think of it in those terms. And maybe, maybe that's just be the way I look at life and look at business and how you manage money.
think you can offer to do less with more in some areas, not with police officers. We were within eight of having a full complement. We need to get back there. We need to get all the way to a full complement. I can't say it any plainer than that. Well, what do you think about the SDO's claim that the SDO 15.3% pay raise? Was the 2005 agreement that called for something more than 9.5 or big claim does, was that a sound agreement or do you wish that hadn't been signed that way? No, I wish it had not been signed that way. I was amazed. That was my first experience with collective bargaining at the city. And I was amazed to see how it worked. I was amazed to see that the council really didn't play much role in it, that it was pretty much something that the city manager did. Um, I was appalled because on the school board we were integrally involved in, in negotiations. We set the parameters and then we periodically got updates from staff as they were negotiating. And if they needed more authority, they had to get it from the council. Here, um, it, was, it, it was remarkable. The most remarkable thing about most of our MOUs, pretty consistently through the years, is that they have a bottom to them regardless of revenue, and that, that's going to change. We're, you know, again, lessons learned. We're not going to have any, you know, at the very least you get 2%. Well, if your revenue hasn't grown 2%, you can't get 2%. That's the way that works. School districts are a little simpler because COLA is a little clearer, but I, you know, we will deal with all of that at the table. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, there's a difference. The MOU was not absolutely clear on the methodology to arrive at what the raise had to be. So the police think that it's 15, the council does not, and at some point that will get settled. Why didn't you object to the agreement at the time? You know, candidly, a little bit of, um, I, I did object, I just didn't vote against it. Um, I, I objected strenuously when I was briefed, the, the, the way that we were handled in those days, and it was my first year on the council. Um, so I'm going to beg a little bit of a learning curve situation. Even though I had a lot of experience with bargaining, this was so different. I thought maybe I was missing something. But we used to be briefed individually. We were not briefed as a council in closed session, which is permissible. And that probably was so that you know two people couldn't have a good idea and, and get a little steam going. Um, I was amazed. I said it was the most. It, it, it was something I was unaccustomed to, and I kind of deferred to the you know to the majority. Uh, thinking. There didn't seem to be a lot of angst about it on the council, and so I went along with something that um, candidly, uh, in retrospect, was not a good, it was not a good agreement. It was good for the union, I, I, you know, I give them credit, but it was, um, it was an effort on the part of the city manager to, to buy some labor peace in the short term, and when you try to do that, you always get what we got, which is stuck in the long term. Yeah, let me ask you about civilian employees. You did say before the primary that civilian employees' benefits and pay package probably should be increased and that they have been suffering for a few year, years in terms of what they get. How, how should their packages be increased and how do you do that given the financial crisis? You may not do it this year. You may not do it next year. But given whatever the economic situation is, I think we really have to tie any increases to income, to you know, a, a scale that makes more sense than just a standard cost of living across the board. I think this is the time, probably in, in cities throughout the state, where people are re-examining how they're negotiating and how, what they're tying increases to. And I think that's healthy and important because, you know, even when I was on the council, we looked at labor agreements that that you know were maybe two percent one year, three percent the next year, but they were never tied to income and. That, that's a key part. As a business person, we do all projections based upon anticipated income, and, and it's, it's critical that, that we start thinking more like private industry when we do this. So um, labor peace is always is something you, you wish for, but part of the issue is really for a mayor and a council to really ask those hard questions about, well, what's the real cost of this going to be? Uh, when I was on the council, I remember getting spreadsheets that basically took out the cost of employee contracts for a number of years out into the future so that we had a sense, at least based upon best guesswork, how much those labor agreements were going to cost us. And so I, I think we need to examine the whole scenario and, and how all of this is put together uh, as we move forward in these difficult economic times because we're not going to be able to give increases. We're going we're to be lucky to maintain jobs. Uh, and I think when it comes down to it, labor unions, by and large, 
want to keep jobs and are willing to negotiate with people in terms of the rest of the package, but if they can, everyone I've talked to, uh, and frankly, not the police department, I've not talked to the police department about this, but the other unions, including fire, are very concerned about maintaining jobs, and they're willing to sit down and talk and negotiate and figure out how we can work through this whole process together. Six years to talk about public access and getting people involved at City Hall. Uh, Clem, you said in your platform that you would make sure that anybody who called City Hall during business hours uh, is answered by a live person. I've called City Hall a few times. Uh, I'm wondering how you get that done. Well, I think you have to you have to get a dedicated line, and you have to have enough people on board to to make that happen. Um, I I don't know that we're going to hire a bunch of people. I don't think we need to hire a bunch of people. We we way underutilize uh, volunteers in this city, and I, I know that we could man enough phones to get a live call. Now, some people don't mind voicemail. I mean, you know, I'm used to it, so as long as I get to the right department, I'm pretty happy. I hear the person's voice, I leave the message. But, you know, a lot of people, when they have concerns, they want to hear a live person. And what we need is a, is a place for them to call where they can get a live person who can then listen to them and then direct them to wherever they need to go. It, it's a very simple thing, I think, really, and I don't think it's going to be an expensive thing at all. But I think it's something that people should have if they want it. And then if they're happy to, to maneuver through, you know, voicemail, then, you know, and, and a lot of the, the world is, or they email, then that's fine. But there are a lot of people who still just need the comfort of a live call, and I, I think that that's something, it, it's, it's kind of a test. If we can't do that, Maybe we shouldn't be trying to do anything any more complicated. And how do you get people more involved in City Hall? And why, why are people involved now, do you think? No, I don't think they're involved now because I think they feel they've been left out of the process. They've been left out of the decision making. They've not been asked their opinions necessarily. Um, I, I think you, you get people involved by seeking their advice, seeking their information. Uh, putting them on commissions and putting them on task forces that deal with the nitty-gritty problems that we face, making them feel like they're a part of the city and actually listening to them when they call you and tell you about situations that occur. And I, I believe, too, we should have live voices at the end of the phone. As a business person, I just abhor companies that have, you know, and it's mostly the large corporations that have voicemail and they reroute people five different places and you never get where you want and you never get to the person you want. So, you know, I certainly support that concept, but, but that, that's a very simple kind of thing in terms of people having access. I think we need to be far more welcoming uh, in terms of the public input. It bothers me that the council agendas don't allow for any public input except during a very short time at the very beginning, that we, we don't have enough opportunities for the public to speak on issues that come before the council uh, that they really should be speaking on, whether it's a, a major development here or whether it's an initiative here. I think we miss out on not hearing what the public has to say. Not that everything should be opened up, because there are very many very routine things, but I think when you have a, a big issue that's coming before the council, other than a public hearing that is, uh, I think it's important that you allow the public to have some input into that or comment on it at the time it's being heard by the City Council. Uh, it, it just seems to me that we've shut out the public in many ways and that makes them feel totally disconnected to City Hall and their representatives. Do you feel that way? No, I don't think we've shut anybody out. I think we can do a better job. Um, I think one of the mechanisms that the, that the new council would use uh, if I'm elected is, is the study session. We don't study a lot of things in public view. And not that you have to, you can read, you know, in private. You don't need people looking over your shoulder. But I know that when we were on the school board, and uh, particularly uh, the first time that I was president, we really opened up and started using more study sessions. And it was, um, it, it was kind of a, of a hybrid. We, we started by you know, hearing what the public had to say on things, and then uh, when we got finished with, with letting the public air its point of view, we, we closed that down, and then the policymakers got, got to have a, a crack at it, but, but not just, you know, a sterile give and take between staff, more of a discussion format. People who were there actually got to see what we were considering, got to kind of, you know, see our thought process, processes in front of them, 
And I thought it was very helpful. In fact, it was during that era that I felt that the, dis the school district started to regain the trust of, of the people in SUSD because they didn't think we were making a bunch of decisions in, you know, behind closed doors. I think that that's, that's pretty effective. The other thing that we need to do is we need to haul the directors out into the public you know, once a quarter or more and you know, pick a spot and, and invite people to come in and, and visit with, with us in, in, in kind of a general forum and then in a specific um, services type of a thing. I think our directors need to, are, are very isolated from the public and need to, need to visit with folks the way, that the, the way that the elected representatives do. We visit with folks on the phone. They call us and they say, hey, I've got a problem and here it is. And we either you know, show up at their business or at their home or with their neighbors or however that's going to go. I don't, I don't see that with, with all of the directors, and I think that they would be amazed at what they would learn if they would just get out into the public and do that. You yes. also said in the platform, I'll, I'll ask both of you if this is, you, you said you'd offer the press an office at City Hall. You'd hold weekly press conferences, and once a month you would have a day where people could come without an appointment to, uh, to meet with, with the mayor. Uh, that's the case? I think those are very simple things, and what, yes. What do you think about those things? Oh, I think that's fine. I mean, I had already figured out that at least one day a month I'd be in my office at the Ballonery and allow the average person to walk in the door without going through a third degree and going through, you know, security measures to get in to see me. Uh, I think it's, it's critical that, that we have that we be accessible and available to the public. And so, you know, I, I have no problem with any of that. One of the things, if I might follow up a bit on, on this whole study session thing, I think study sessions obviously are, are, are important. I would like to see them televised. I would like to see them actually out there where people who can't make it at 7.30 in the morning could view what's happening. Right now within the current city council agenda format, so many things are on consent agenda. They're, they're, they just happen and they're approved routinely without a report to the, to the citizens. My experience is we really need to be educating the public more about what we're doing. And some of those items that are routinely approved on consent really should be pulled out and explanations given to the public about what's happening and, and, and how it's being projected. So they understand that's all part of the public education process that hasn't really been happening very much lately. And then to, I, I'd like to speak to the idea of having study sessions where the public speaks first and then the policymakers talk. I think it should be reversed. Uh, I think that all the discussion, the reports, what have you, from city staff, from the policymakers should happen. And then the public should be allowed to ask questions, make comments after they've heard all the information. Because frankly, you don't know until you've heard the whole presentation what questions might arise. And it just seems to me that why have the public say something first if they don't know what is even being fully presented? You talked about security at City Hall. Do you think that those security gates should come down and that people should be able to walk around where the, the offices are on the second floor, I knock on the mayor's office? I think that door is a barrier, much like the gates around Weber Point are barriers. I think that gives the wrong impression of the second floor. Now, should someone be there, a secretary at a desk? Yes, absolutely. There should be someone there to help direct people into the second floor offices. But, you know, it's like you have to have a pass key to get into the second floor of City Hall. Now, as a council member, we never had to go through that. We were able to walk in. We rarely had problems with, quote, uh, undesirables coming into the second floor. People usually got screened well before they got there, either downstairs or above. So I just think it's a deterrent. It's not an open environment. It's not a welcoming city hall, at least on the second floor. Downstairs, people can walk into the city clerk, the fire department, the billiard, everybody else. They can just walk into an office and have and be helped. But the question is, why is it? Why are why is everybody so important on the second floor of City Hall that they have to be locked down? Well, they can actually only walk into counters on the first floor. They can't just walk into the office. True. Spaces. They walk but, to counters. That's but, right. But, you know, unless at some point, you know, the rhetoric gets, you know, extreme. It is a, it's a, it's a business office building and people are doing work. And so I don't think you want anybody just kind of wandering around. Um, I'm, I'm not, you know, that hung up on the on the door one way or the other. Uh, it's there, and probably if you have a reason to go through it, you have a reason to go through it. I think one of the things, one of the ways you soften up City Hall is by doing what I said, and, and it's letting people come in to visit with the mayor, and you know breaking down some of those barriers and, and letting them come in. 
Um, again, they're not going to go snooping around in offices, but they're going to get to come back and, and uh, you know, maybe the mayor moves his desk out to the foyer to, to break down a barrier, or maybe we, we make it easier for him to, to get back to that corner office. I'm not quite sure how it's all going to work, but um, people do work in a business, and, and you go into most businesses, there's some sort of a, of a way to, to keep people, you know, in a, in a certain place, and unless they have a legitimate reason for being somewhere else. I don't, you know. Let's, let's, uh, and what do you give up because of the budget crisis? Twenty-three and a half million dollars. What had you wanted to do that you don't do now, or at least for a couple of years? What do you give up? Well, that's a that's an excellent question, and my belief is that you can do a whole lot with what you already have, and if too much is being cut, you're going to have to maybe minimize uh, some of the bodies on the street or in the office building, some of the people who are actually providing service. But I would say you compensate for that by developing partnerships with other agencies, whether it's the county, the school districts, nonprofits, where you can, where you can maximize your joint resources to, to work on the problems that, that we all have. So, I, I don't want to say you give up anything. I think you figure out a way to make things happen given the res resources that you have. Bringing the community in and the, the other community partners that we have so that they buy into this. I believe firmly that the business community in Stockton needs to step up to the plate, particularly work you know, within the schools to develop programs, to adopt a school, to help with the truancy piece with the mentoring piece, with those kinds of things that ultimately, hopefully sooner rather than later, reduce our crime rate. So I think you just don't say give up. You say, how do we make, how do we do as much, if not more, with what we have and we have to work with? That, that's all you can do at this time. It's the same questions to you. Oh, is it? Okay. Well, and if you did want to engage each other, well, we're going to have to give up $23 million worth of, of, of expenditures, and that will probably equate to giving something up. Um, I think that, that um, we're going to need to make some cuts in, in administration and support. I think that we're going to, from there, we're going to have to look really hard at, at all of the services that the city performs and we're going to have to decide you know tough things like do we keep the libraries open the same number of days as we always have or do we you know fiddle with the hours now I've said library so all the library people are going to holler at me well guess what somebody's going to holler at me before this is all over because some things are going to get cut a couple of things that we're not looking at and um, it, it's frustrating you know I, I think that that um, there, there are savings in, in the health uh, benefits program, savings to the city without um, without reducing the health benefits to the employee. Actually, I think employees could get could get more flexibility, more money in their pocket if we if we would have a good hard look at the benefits program. And I have been saying that uh, for some time um, on the council. The other thing is that we need to we we need to look at services in in terms of whether or not it is really particularly under this kind of economic climate appropriate for the city to be, even be attempting to provide services. There are undoubtedly services that the city provides that could more efficiently and more economically be provided in, in the private sector. And while we may not want to raise all of those businesses that in the next moment, we, we probably should have some sort of a strategy for, for getting there. So there will be cuts, a real thing, that won't just be doing less uh, doing more with less or less with more, or whatever you want to say, it, it really is going to be about cutting things. I think it's important, too, that, that we pay attention to what our employees are saying about cuts that, that they could stomach and stand in. Uh, there have been several documents produced by the city, employee cost savings suggestions. It is a whole litany of very, very interesting suggestions that I think we should all examine collectively and determine which ones could actually be, be implemented. And it's low-hanging fruit. It's the kinds of things that employees see in their, in their daily work life. And, and, you know, I think that that's who you talk to to figure out 
what the low-hanging fruit is. And, you know, there's probably 150 suggestions that the employees have come up with that everything from working four 10-hour days a week to, you know, being closed on Fridays to save energy costs, you know, to looking at benefit reductions, to shopping at, at um, Costco and Walmart for things rather than Office Depot, to, to a variety of what seems like minuscule things, but in reality, the pennies and the dollars all add up, and in the end, it makes a difference, and people who are on the front line kind of know whether they need to have the city provide them coffee or not, or whether the city should be funding lunches and dinners and travel and things like that. What are some of those suggestions that you think are good ideas? Well, I think uh, one of them is offer a uh, voluntary furlough uh, to let people work reduced, a voluntary furlough, they, re they work reduced hours for reduced pay. Um, again, work eight hours, uh, 80 hours in nine days, closing every other Friday to save on overhead. Do away with take-home vehicles. Um, again, work four-day work weeks with 10-hour days. Uh, provide police department community service officers with specific daily purposes. Apparently, they don't have specific daily purposes. Uh, then there are things that, I mean, those, those make sense. Um, uh, what do you think about those, Clint? I think, th I think there are a lot of good ideas in there, and, and it's, a, you know, it, a lot of them are under consideration. But it isn't going to extract us from the fact that when the predominance of your budget is in salary and benefits, you're, you're not going to solve a $23 million program with, you know, with too many of these, of these little items. It's that, it's that simple. I don't want to seem callous. I've actually, I keep up with that list and I, I, you know, fire off the ones that I think, you know, somebody really ought to, or sometimes I say, are we really doing that? Because candidly, I'm interested, uh, if we are, in some of those cases. But ultimately, this is going to come down to dealing with, with, uh, with jobs and, and benefits. Yeah. That's, where the, that's where the savings and the revenues and the expenditures all live. We talked about administration cuts early, earlier. Do you think that City Hall is administration heavy? What was the question? City Do you Hall think that City Hall is admin heavy? Do you think there are too many uh, upper level administrators? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the one thing I was sorry to see in the reorganization was, was a fourth kind of a deputy city manager. That wasn't really the direction that, that I thought that we should head. I think that you need to, you know, the, the work happens where it happens. and. And certainly you have to have leadership and you have to have, you know, good folks leading those departments. But you can often, and we found this with the school district because, you know, we didn't cut teachers. We tried not to cut too many classified folks, but we certainly um, cut a lot of administrators. Uh, you know, because you, if you can live without them, it makes things, you know, a little harder work for the remaining administrators. But I, I think you just need to have a good hard look at that. I, I'm very much in favor of that. Yeah, City Hall is definitely top heavy. And I did not support the addition of two deputy city managers. I was concerned that the two existing ones were not even doing their jobs. So to add two more just made it, just compounded the problem. Would you be rid of all three of them? I'm not going to say I'm going to get rid of anyone. I'm going to reevaluate what they're actually doing and see, find out because, you know, not being in City Hall at the moment and day to day in terms of what they're doing, I want to see what they're doing. and and uh, before I make that decision, just like with the, with the city manager. But I think uh, they need to be able to justify their existence to me uh, and why we don't have an assistant city manager, someone who in fact um, would take over when the city manager wasn't there, who is an expert in financial stuff. I think, not that I would add that as a position, but I think it needs to be reorganized, frankly. And I did not approve of the reorganization that took place. Because in the end, you know, two people moved up from the ranks and then they had, those positions had to be back. So, you know, you're, you've got, you know, four, 200, 350000 dollars in salaries right there in two positions minimum. Probably more like 400000 in two positions. That would go a long way. Yeah, they, they didn't backfill the positions that the directors moved out of. Just to be clear. Let's talk about education and jobs. Uh, I view these as two topics that you've both talked a lot about, but the, the city has maybe less involvement in the, than in other areas where it has some direct control. So 
I suppose it's for you, Clem. How do you think the city's relationship has been with the school districts here during your tenure? Uh, and, and what what do we have to show for it? Well, I think it's been very strong. I mean, you know, the, the current mayor has chaired three school bond campaigns uh, very artfully and very successfully. I think that the I think that the local schools have enjoyed a strong relationship with uh, with city councils going back to Joan Dara's time. I remember meeting jointly with the Stockton City Council when she was the mayor, and I was on the Stockton School Board, and we did that again uh, with Podesto. Um, some I think the the relationships could could be. Um, Stronger isn't the word. I think, you know, if, if they call, the city shows up, and if, if the city calls, they, they attend. I mean, we're, we're attentive to one another. I think we can, we can do more important things together. And I think that there's a lot of potential for that. Um, you're right, we don't have a lot of, uh, of, of direct control, and uh, I'm, I'm certainly not going to suggest anytime soon that the city take over the, the schools, but we can you know, just this community, this full-service community school notion is, is a pretty profound thing that the new superintendent of Stockton Unified wants to do. Um, there, there's going to be, that whole model will be, you know, full of opportunities for the, for the city to, to get involved. Yeah, the same as you. Well, under Mayor Darrow, I was on the council that started the, the joint meetings with trustees from the local school districts, and they were very effective, and they were, ha they were actually meeting regularly, like once a month. Uh, I and, and uh, Victor Mao at the time, who represented North Stockton, met with representatives from uh, the Lodi Unified School District as well as Lincoln, because that was in his area too. Uh, that was really important because we were able to look at problems that the schools were facing and work with them to solve them, whether it was school safety, you know, street problems, uh, uh, people hanging around in the parks adjacent to the schools. A lot of it was safety issues and crime issues, uh, as well as working on the after-school programs because we really developed the after-school programs during that time. So they were very productive. At that time, too, we met with trustees on not a regular basis, but about once a year we would meet, it would yeah. seem to me, with the trustees. And it was a good exchange, and I think that that has all kind of gone away. There isn't, there isn't the dedication to continuing ongoing meetings and discussing ongoing issues. And, you know, as mayor, I believe that, that we should be in continuous communication with the superintendents of our local school districts because we, the community has everything at stake if the schools don't succeed. And our job, the jobs that we bring into this city are truly dependent upon an educated workforce. And so it's in our best interest to work with school districts to reduce truancy. And I, I know Superintendent Amato is very keen on that. Uh, uh, the whole business about keeping schools safe, working with the resources that we have. The city, we started the truancy center down on um, um, uh, Main Street. We began that project with Stockton Unified and Lodi Unified back when I was on the city council. And it, it, some of the activities faded away after a number of years, but that's a key part of, of keeping kids in school. So I think that we need to have regular um, uh, focused meetings with the school district superintendents about common problems and issues that we as a city can help assist and they can, they can work with us on. And it, again, it's all about leadership and having the right people in the right places to do that. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think the regular meetings are important. But as a participant in some of those meetings, they, meeting for the sake of meeting yeah. is, is kind of a drag too. And you, know, you kind of end up saying, you know, why are we here? We're here to be important. We're here to talk, to listen to ourselves or whatever. And, and so, Here's, here's what I really think we ought to do, and this is where the symbolic power of the, of the mayor's office, I think, you know, lends itself very well. I think what we say is, okay, look, let's make sure community-wide that every K through third student is attended to and given the support that he needs so that he doesn't get into gang and he doesn't start, you know, get into the drug culture. Now, that's a huge thing to do. So how do we, how do we deal with it? Well, it's kind of like when Podesto wanted to, to improve, you know, racial relations. You start. And I think that, that 
we don't embrace community-based organizations well enough, and we certainly don't embrace faith-based organizations enough. We keep them at a total stiff arm. You know, we're all scared to death of, you know, church and state, and all, you know, someone might actually try to convert somebody to some, I mean, you know what, I'll deal with that problem. Here we have, you know, hundreds of, of organizations citywide that are set up to deal with human beings on this very level, and we shut them out. We need to get them into the tent, and we need to figure out the most massive infusion of effort toward K3 kids going. Now, that doesn't mean somebody's going to watch this and say, oh, well, he's going to turn his back on the older kids. Look, it isn't about that. We, we will maintain what we have going. But it's about, instead of just having these endless meetings, and, I, and I'm, you need to be meeting about something. So let's make it about that. Let's make it about making the full-service community schools a reality as the centerpieces of this, of this massive infusion of effort. What if every elected person in town, administrator in town, department head in town, business owner in town adopted one troubled kid in the city of Stockton? We make this big push with San Joaquin A+, and I'm not knocking it, to get, to get a person in every K, what, K, is it K3 classroom, K6 classroom in the city for the read-in or whatever? Well, that's great. That's one day. Let's have everybody adopt a kid and find out what that kid's problem is and see if we can't make a difference in his life. Everybody has time to do that. Every single person in this city has time to do it. It's time for a call to action. That's the sort of a thing that the mayor could do. What do you think about that? Oh, obviously I think it's important that the mayor's office set the example of the priorities within the city and education is a key priority. And so. I've already stated in my campaign, I believe in adopting a school, whether it's a business, a CBO, a faith-based organization, a service group, we need to engage the community in the schools because that's the only way we be, can begin to solve our problems within the schools and use the, the resources that we have in this community. So whether it's an adopt-a-kid or adopt-a-school or getting in there, I think the message really is it's a community problem, it's a community issue, and it demands a community response to that. And it's not just one day a year, I would agree. It's 365 days a year that we have to be engaged with our schools. Now, schools don't always want people on the outside to be engaged with them. So that's where you really have to work with school principals, you have to work with the administration, you have to show them that, that the, the help and the, and the willingness to be involved is mutually beneficial. One of the agencies in, in, San, in uh, Stockton is Community Partnership for Families, which again is a community-based organization that's funded by a variety of people that tries to address the issues that, that Clem has mentioned about dealing with children and their families and how to provide the services, how to help them succeed through, through the system, whether you know, a child comes to school, a kindergarten teacher can immediately identify if there's an issue in the family, can immediately tell whether there's a problem there, and we need to get intervention happening right away and put all the resources in the community, whether it's health resources, whether it is, you know, uh, family uh, counseling, whether it's drug intervention, we need to get them in the lives of that family and try and intervene very early on. Uh, I was at a presentation of First Five yesterday and the success that they're having in terms of helping children from zero to five get the skills they need to go into school. Those are important programs. Now, I, before, I, before I stop, I want to mention Peacekeepers, which is a, a city school district, in a sense, joint program. Peacekeepers is funded by the city. They're funded by the police department. These gang outreach workers go into the schools. They go into the community, and they work with gang members or want to be gang members and they've had a significant impact in the, in the schools. They've just now got back to a six or seven of them. They used to be at a force of ten. We're able to reduce gang related homicides from like 22 down to two in the late 90s. It's key that the city still provides resources to help the schools because these particular kinds of outreach workers the schools appreciate and welcome and work with. And so this is an example of how city and school can work together on a problem that impacts both, and that's crime. I think that we're done with the core of this. We have some reader questions. Okay. Since we've already addressed one of the reader questions, I'll add a question that came from talking with readers. So we have five of them. Let's recall who this first goes to. 
So the last question went to Clem, so this goes to you, Anne. Do one minute responses on each of these. It's not an open discussion. We'll just hear okay. what you have to say, and then we'll hear what you have to say, and then we'll go on to the next one. So the first question is, how would you re-energize and engage younger Stocktonians into taking a role of heightened involvement and responsibility in their own families, neighborhoods, and community as a whole? I guess you lead by example. You basically show how people can get involved. You offer, the, offer them opportunities that w would engage them, would be interesting to them. Again, you work with the schools to offer those kinds of opportunities uh, through service clubs, through the, the uh, student organizations. Community service is a requirement in many of our high schools. I think that's key. We need to expand that in those that don't because the students need to see what's happening. They need to get involved and be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And, and reward them and recognize them and praise them uh, very publicly all the time for the kinds of things that they can offer when they get involved because we simply don't have that many opportunities for them. Same to you, how do you engage the other stuff? Well, you educate them. You know, educated folks are more engaged. It's, it's amazing how that works. And, and I don't want to oversimplify the answer. And, and there, you know, there are a million things we can do if we can do them. But ultimately, if you have, um, you know, literate kids and functional families, you're going to have engaged folks. It, it's pretty much that simple. So I think the whole key comes down to that massive effort that I was talking about, that massive community-wide effort to make sure that young kids have all, every bit of the support that they need to be literate, gang-free, drug-free. And, and then I think, you know, the whole process of, of, of doing that is going to be a process of engagement. The next question then goes to you. Now this is, should the city maintain or increase funding for after-school activities to give children a different direction? How do you achieve this given the current budget? Well, it's, yeah, isn't that the $64,000 question? And I take the 64000 gladly and apply it to the, to the deficit. Um, I think that the, the, the best answer, though, is in Amato's full-service community schools, because what that will do is that's going to maximize the use of facilities that already exist. And if you're, if you're really good about, if you're smart, not smart, sometimes lucky, sometimes I'd rather be lucky, you get um, service providers in there, it, it's a way to, to mitigate the cost of full service community schools. And I think that that's how you do it. I think as revenues exist, you, you put them into these programs and you, you try to create a model of sustainability so that the, you know, so that the program doesn't dry up. But I, I really think that it's, it's a, that multi-agency, that community-based effort that make this pencil out. Same to you, Anne. What about after school programs? Obviously, they're essential. I have advocated for years since I was on the Lodi School Board that our public schools should be open from early morning till 10 o'clock at night to provide a safe place, a, a place for programs, for tutoring, for activities, for not only the students, but the community, the neighborhood in which people live. I, that's why I'm so glad to see the Stockton Unified is embracing that concept and working toward that. As to funding of after-school programs, I think the city can do it within a very limited uh, uh, budget at this particular point in time, but I would engage other organizations, whether they're faith-based organizations or CBOs, to use facilities that exist already, help them find a way that they can be part of the solution within existing facilities. So again, it's going to take a partnership to do this. I don't think it should just be on the city's hook or on the school's hook or, or you know, business. We need to work together and fund what we can, where we can, and make it work. And the next question to you then, uh, what do you consider to be the most undesirable mayoral duty and why? And uh, how would you be successful in performing that undesirable duty? The mo I don't know that anything is undesirable. I, I, I look forward to, to meeting the challenge and enjoying every moment of it. I really believe that if you can't have fun at what you're doing and enjoy what you're doing, it's time to get out because tough decisions need to be made, but it takes you know, a, a level head and experience to do that. Um, I, I couldn't identify the toughest thing other than having to tell people who come before you asking for money that there is no money. 
uh, that you cannot satisfy their wishes. That's probably the hardest part because by nature you want to satisfy everyone in the community whether it is fixing their trees or their streets and sometimes you simply can't do it. So that's probably the most difficult thing. Same to you, Clem. What's an undesirable mayoral duty and how would you do it? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to select two uh, regardless of the fact that you asked for one. Uh, the first is in dealing with, with greedy or disingenuous people who want things for themselves and who who seek to animate the city council and city hall for their own for their own uses? I find that very um, distasteful now, and I'm sure I will continue to dislike it uh, when I'm the mayor. The other thing, on a different level, when, when I was first elected to the council, I inquired about you know I I feel a real attachment to people who are the victims of violent crime, and and I I sought to to somehow know when such victims existed. I wanted to be able to, to know that things had happened and to kind of reach out. I was really rebuffed by the system. I was told basically that that, that would just be far too cumbersome, that everyone, and, and I just shook my head in disbelief and I, and I kind of left it alone. But I want to make sure that when people are, are the victims of violent crime and they're in the hospital, that somebody from the city is there saying, you know, we're here, we're, we're as one, and if I can, you know, if there's something that can be done, we want to do it. The next question is to you then. It's, uh, as mayor, what could you do about transportation, particularly mass transit, for commuters to the Bay Area, Sacramento, and Modesto? Well, it's, it's funny that you say that. I, I, I thought that we, we need to do more, but the, the, the density of the West is still just not, it, that kind of stuff doesn't pencil out. I think that we have a couple of things going on. You know, we have BART, we have the, the ACE, you know, Commuter Express. Um, uh, I think we need to maximize those. Um, you know, beyond that, I, I think just our, our internal stuff, you know, we've done great work with RTD. They're a super organization that has expanded their service in the community, uh, partly through a partnership with Stockton Unified that has been a kind of a win-win situation. And I think that, you know, part of this attorney uh, general settlement includes a real strong eye toward toward transit uh, for future development. So I think we just take every opportunity we can to, to reduce that carbon footprint and, and do a better job with transit. Well, I think we have a, a unique opportunity since we sit on the COG board in terms of uh, looking at the funding on Measure K projects because Measure K provides transportation uh, between and among cities and as well as taking care of local street repairs and, and uh, facilities. So I think that's a key part of, of the input that we should be encouraging more trains for ACE. We should be encouraging BART to extend you know, its service. Not that COG pays for that, but I think we need to maximize the, the Measure K dollars with matching state funds and federal grants. We, we've done very well so far. That's really where the hope is in terms of coming to grips with some of this. Plus working with our state and federal legislators in terms of highway funds and improvement funds for the infrastructure that needs to be created between San Joaquin County and the Bay Area. And, and working to get those funds with our, with our local congressmen into San Joaquin County. Pretty good. The last question then for you, Ann. What should the mayor be doing about the foreclosure crisis? Well, the mayor should be uh, out there talking to people and hoping to, to uh, advise them regarding the, the avenues that they could take to help solve their own personal uh, crisis. Uh, we need to be working with, again, our federal and state legislators who are crafting solutions for that. Uh, the city of Stockton has recently received a $12.1 million grant through Housing and Urban Development to buy foreclosed homes and make them available for affordable housing for local residents. I don't believe the program has been put in place yet. The money's not here yet. But if we had an infusion of money like that, we could help solve some of the, the local foreclosure issues that there are. Plus, we need to make sure that we keep code enforcement hot and heavy in the blighted neighborhoods so that that you know, a foreclosed home doesn't bring down the value of the rest of the neighborhood. So those are really key things. It's multi multitask. Yeah, we, we've increased the, the regulation of, of homes and foreclosure and the, making sure that the banks are, are you know, held accountable to, uh, for keeping those up. We, we've advocated uh, repeatedly with our state and federal representatives. Uh, we've sought funding. We've when we 
when there are funding sources, we try to funnel them uh, appropriately to agencies that are already set up to deliver the type of counseling and the type of help to people that they need in the short term with a specific eye on people who can save their loans, because some of them are savable, and I think that that's important. Um, we're suing, uh, you know, a, a, collect, uh, a small collection of the, of the uh, perpetrators of this mass fraud as a city, and, and uh, you know, holding them accountable. I, I think that we're really doing, we, we don't have a direct role, we have a, somewhat of a reactionary role, but I think that we're, we're up to speed and we are appropriately addressing this on many fronts. As, as Ann said, it's a kind of multitask. That's it. Thanks both. Okay.